We're going to talk uh, today, uh, we'll start with uh, some uh, introduction, we'll go over the basics of uh, compression, and we will revisit the original crime attack, and then we move on to the, our new contribution to this uh, attack, is expanding crime in the sense that increasing the attack surface uh, we're changing the target of this attack to HTTP response, and later on introducing the time attack, which uh, shift the target from measuring uh, payload size to measuring payload send time, which in turn eliminates the need for the attacker to be an eavesdropper, which uh, in turn then relaxes the requirement for the crime attack, and we will conclude with some uh, suggested uh, mitigation against uh, this attack. So let's start with the talking about compression over the web, and this is the state it, it has been prior to a uh, crime attack. And compression over the web is based on the GZIP uh, algorithm, and the common compression is the compression of the HTTP response body. And this is, most of us when we think about HTTP compression, it's really the HTTP response body compression. And there are some more uncommon compression that use the GZIP uh, algorithm too, this, uh, compressing the HTTP request body for a, a file upload, for example, and some header compression uh, in the case of the SSL compression, which compress the whole channel, including the uh, headers and all other parts of the message, and also Speedy, uh, which compresses uh, uh, the HTTP request header too. And so GZIP is really comprised of the LZ algorithm that was developed in uh, Israel by Lampel Ziv in the late 70s. Uh, it compresses uh, repeating stri strings in a lossless, asymptotically op optimal way with uh, no overhead, no extra dictionaries. So therefore it's a good candidate for a, a web compression. And how does it work? Well, uh, let's take the first verses of the uh, of Genesis, and instead of uh, coding uh, uh, repeating uh, strings explicitly, we can use a pointer, a back reference. So, uh, in the beginning, God created. So, we already had a blank, and then T H E, and then uh, space again. So, we don't need to uh, explicitly code it, we can just give a back reference, go back 25 steps, and copy five uh, characters from that point, and so forth. And uh, we can see that uh, a lot of uh, human-generated text are, are extremely, uh, the redundancy within it of repeating uh, strings is uh, very big, and therefore the compression is uh, very valuable. And let's go over to the relationship between compression, compression and encryption. So if I want to both compress my data so it would take less space and also encrypt it because I want to keep it secret. So I can first compress and then encrypt or I can encrypt and then compress. So, so I can do both things. But which is the, mo the more logical thing to do? Well, of course, you should first compress your data and then encrypt it because uh, encryption uh, removes uh, any sense of redundancy uh, from the original uh, plain text. So if you, are, uh, if you are encrypting and then compressing and the compression is actually compressing something, then it probably means that your encryption algorithm is not so good. So in order to, uh, to efficiently compress, the compression must be applied on the plain text and not on the cipher text. And this is exactly the fact, that fact that uh, original crime used, uh, used. And in uh, about a year ago, Rizon Wong, I hope I pronounced it correctly, uh, introduced the compression ratio infolic made easy crime attack, which is a chosen plain text attack model, and we will discuss what does it mean. And it targets compression information leakage. 
So let's first understand the attack model. Uh, as always, we have Alice and Bob that communicating uh, securely uh, through encryption between uh, one another, and we have Eve, the eavesdropper. So the eavesdropper, uh, the attacker has capability not only to eavesdrop, but also to choose arbitrary plain text to be encrypted and obtain the corresponding ciphertext. So Eve can tell Alice to tell Bob something and watch it get sent over uh, the wire, the uh, encrypted uh, form of, uh, of uh, Eve's uh, chosen text. And in a slide, and we will uh, go into details of it, but let's get, get a, a first impression of the crime attack. So the attacker in this case is sending some plain text for the victim. So the victim now compresses and encrypts it. And the attacker is also able to measure the data size since it since the uh, attacker is an eavesdropper. So uh, and let's remember that compression, LZ compression, uh, compresses repeating string. So what the attacker tries to do is try to guess uh, the secret data uh, within uh, uh, within uh, Alice uh, sent data, and if the and if the guess is correct, then this is a repeating string, and the repeating string gets compressed, and the result will be shorter payload compared to incorrect guesses. And using that method, the attacker uh, can uh, can discover the secret in a character by character fashion, or more formally, if we put it into an algorithm, the attacker start with uh, some initial guess, which is a known prefix of the secret string and tries to append a, a symbol from the alphabet if and compares the results and it takes the shorter the shortest uh, uh, payload it observes it gets sent over the wire compressed and encrypted and uh, then it, it uh, distinguished the uh, a good guess by a uh, because it's the shortest uh, payload, has the shortest payload length. <coughs> and now the attacker can add another symbol to this uh, guess and go on to discover the whole secret by appending a character by character uh, time after time. Uh, so how does this theoretical model fits in into HTTP reality and, and as we see it on the web. So the attacker is an eavesdropper, he sees ciphertext, and attacker creates HTTP request interactively via JavaScript. So as an attacker, the attacker has full control over the URL and can predict the headers, but does not control or sees the cookies because uh, the attacker don't see it on the wire because it's, uh, the transport is uh, encrypted and it cannot recover it directly from a script because due to the same origin uh, policy which does not allow scripts from one side to access data from another side. So the attacker doesn't have the ability to directly uh, discover the secret cookie. But using that uh, uh, crime attack, the attacker can guess, let's say, in this case, the secret cookie, cookie name is session ID equals something. So the attacker starts with session ID equals A and measure the, the size of this payload. And after a few tries, it tries session ID equals D. And since this is a correct guess, so this uh, payload will be better compressed and therefore will result shorter payload over the wire and the attacker can observe that and say, okay, I know this is the correct guess. And now I'm moving on and I'll try to guess uh, the next character. And that way it goes on and on until it discovers the whole secret cookie. And so that's basically what we said in this slide. 
So there are some practical issues with, uh, with the crime attack, but uh, it mostly works. And what was the aftermath of the crime attack? Uh, speedy implementation canceled or modified header compression. Uh, and so cookies are not being compressed with the URL, so the attacker cannot uh, create guesses from the URL she controls on the cookie she cannot see. And also Chrome, which was the only browser that supported SSL compression, had disabled the SSL compression. So um, the result is uh, that crime attack is no longer relevant since there is no attack surface. There is nothing that compresses HTTP uh, request headers and cookies. So we are on a mission to resurrect uh, the crime attack, and we do so by extending the crime for HTTP responses. This is where our new contributions begin. And uh, so let's break down crime to its basic elements and ingredients, and we see what we have to uh, modify and come up with in order to transfer the attack target from being on the HTTP request to the HTTP response. So you need, you need the data to be encrypted, to be compressed. You need a secret element. The secret element should have some kind of prefix or suffix so you would have, you will be able to start with some initial guess. And you need to control some part of the message so you can put, so the attacker can put her message within the payload and get it compressed together and then see and the results. So uh, as encryption and compression remains the same. SSL and GZIP on both request and response, so nothing to do there. We're changing the secret element location from the request header and the cookie header to response body, but then the problems uh, show up because uh, in the pre when a crime was applied to request, the secret element was the cookie value, and we had the prefix of cookie name. But when we go to HTTP response, it, this uh, secret data and its prefix is application specific. And also, what seems to be even a harder problem, the chosen plain text location, uh, well, what, it's very obvious when uh, you have a uh, on HTTP request, you are, the attacker controls the URL, but what does the attacker control when it tries to uh, find something on the HTTP response? It comes from the server, not from the client. So let's tackle these uh, problems. First, secrets and response data. So we need a secret with a known prefix or suffix, but luckily they are everywhere because application secrets are in the Content. That's the reason why they are uh, why uh, applications are uh, under the SSL and encryption. So everything secret, uh, all your secret data is transferred under SSL with your bank account, uh, whatever is over SSL. So there are a lot of secrets on HTTP response, and secrets are often structured. So they have a fixed prefix or suffix, as this. Uh, uh, example shows, so it, it would say uh, phone number and then you'll fo it will be followed by your phone number or your uh, bank balance is and then your bank balance. So although this is application specific, it's not uncommon and you will find a secret, structured secrets everywhere. So let's move on. So we dealt with the, the secret element and the secret element prefix suffix, so we are left with the chosen plain text location. So there, again, the solution is application specific, and again, it's not unfrequent. Because many application embeds user input as expressed with HTTP parameters within the response. And in fact, many times these parameters will be embedded even if there were no uh, parameters in, on the original request, as this uh, example from uh, Twitter shows that uh, originally this uh, URL had no parameters at all, uh, but uh, I had uh, added a question mark and then x equals my string and x equals my string uh, got embedded within the response. So 
the attacker have opportunities to embed uh, his her user controlled data within the response so let's sum up we came up with all the ingredients for a, a crime attack and um, let's demonstrate it using a proof of concept that we had created on a Google Scholar site. Google Scholar is a search engine for uh, academic uh, citations. You can uh, input uh, the author name and get all of his uh, articles and papers. Uh, so in this case, we see the uh, blue, the blue box. We can see that the, uh, the attacker can uh, control by by using the HTTP parameter, in this case, uh, guess at gmail.com, it gets embedded within the response as the, we see that the blue box, uh, uh, the blue blo box uh, uh, that denotes the guess at gmail.com at the response, and we are trying to find the victim's uh, username within Gmail, which is, in this case, Honey Medhatter, which is uh, some account we uh, created over uh, Gmail, and we have implemented this proof of concept with uh, with Python that actually just uh, uh, discovered the the uh, uh, username just by using uh, but just by observing the length. So. We start with our initial guess, and we can see that the, uh, our algorithm is able to recover the secret, which is, again, the username is Gmail, uh, character by character. We see that sometimes uh, the algorithm iterates throughout all the alphabet, and sometimes it is able to find it pretty quick because we added some heuristics that says that if uh, the size of, uh, if we add one more character and yet the size remains the same, then it means that this is the correct guess because the, th this will be the shortest guess. Shortest guess. So sometimes uh, the algorithm does not need to try all the, all the alphabet, just a uh, few characters in order to uh, in order to determine which is the correct uh, characters, and we're pretty much at the end. And at the end, uh, the algorithm will try uh, the alphabet, and, is, and we'll see that, uh, well, it cannot determine which is the best guess because they are all the same. And for the algorithm, we know that uh, it was finished, and we had reached uh, the final. Uh, the final. I should have picked up maybe a shorter username, but uh, we're already at the end. Yeah. So in the end, the, uh, it was shown that uh, all almost all characters uh, yields the same payload size, and therefore, uh, we probably this is the end of uh, of the secret data since all guesses are pretty, are the same, yield the same result. So we have extended and resurrected the crime attack, and now it can, instead of attacking the requests it, it, that where the attack surface is uh, no longer exists, it attacks the responses. And let's move on to the our time attack, which I think is even more important than the extended crime. So what is the motivation for time attack? Uh, crime attack model had some very limiting attack precondition. The attacker needs to be both eavesdropper and also control the web page the victim visits. While uh, directing user traffic to a control uh, website is a fairly easy task, you can use a phishing email or with advertising or all other schemes, but eavesdropping to the victim's traffic with some secured uh, site is not an easy task and usually requires some physical proximity between the attacker and the victim. And of course, whenever physical proximity is needed, it really uh, makes the attack uh, much less uh, practical. So if only we could drop the eavesdropping requirement, then it would make a crime uh, a practical attack. 
and therefore we introduced the time attack, which is timing info leak made easy. Again, the attack model is uh, the chosen plain text uh, attack model, and we are targeting timing information leakage instead of size information leakage. And this is quite a complex argument, so we break it down to three claims. So the first claim is that HTTP payload size may carry sensitive information, and more specifically, the you don't need to know the absolute value of the site. You just need to, observe, to, to distinguish, to be able to distinguish between differences in, in sizes. And, well, we will show that. And afterwards, we will see that using timing measurement, attacker can distinguish that HTTP payload size differences. So you do not, you do not need to explicitly and directly uh, measure the traffic size, you can just uh, measure the timing of the attack. And finally, we will show that it can, all of this can be done using a JavaScript. So if we combine all of these claims together, the result will be that attackers can learn the user sensitive information using JavaScript from their site with no if dropping, which of course will make this attack much more practical. So our new attack model does not, we don't need any if dropping, we just need if to be able to tell Alice uh, what to transmit to Bob, and that's it. And the rest will be taken care of with JavaScript on Alice, uh, on the website that Alice visits. So let's visit our first claim that there is sensitive information in HTTP payload site. Well, we had shown already with the original crime that there are some, that the size information uh, carries some sensitive data for HTTP requests. We showed, we had shown with the, H, with the, the extended crime that again, size information can leak data uh, and contains some sensitive data. But we can also think of much simpler and not crime-related examples uh, of uh, information in size, uh, found in size. For example, let's say uh, your bank uh, balance is not being uh, compressed, and you know that if you have uh, four figures in your uh, bank balance, then it's, uh, one, the response size is 100 bytes, and if you have five, then it's 101, and so on. So, uh, so again, uh, even it's, if it's not, and it's not related at all to crime, uh, the size information has contains some uh, valuable information. And we can see, I, I'm sure we can all think of all other scenarios where the size uh, uh, information leaks data. And moreover, we can see in all of these examples, we don't really need to know what is the exactly exact size value, the absolute size value. We just need to be able to observe the, the difference, such in crime. We don't care uh, what is the absolute size of the payload over the network. We just want to get the shortest uh, one. So we need to distinguish between shorter and longer, but we don't need to explicitly have the uh, absolute value. And same goes for the bank balance figure example that we had mentioned earlier. So we had concluded that uh, size information leaks data and moreover, the size diff information, size difference information leaks data. Uh, let's move on and say we claim that timing reveals payload size differences. And it should be very intuitive that uh, uh, page size is highly correlated with the time it takes it to be transmitted over the network. And in fact, uh, the first uh, advice and the first tip in any performance, uh, HTTP for performance guide is make uh, your web page smaller by, for example, compressing them or removing unnecessary elements. So making the web faster minimize payload size. So size and timing are highly correlated. And Google web page uh, speed tips for developers says that the amount of data sent in each server response can add significant latency to your application. 
And in addition to the network cost of the actual byte transmitted, there is also a penalty incurred for crossing an IP packet boundary. And let's talk about this IP packet boundary. So <coughs> the client says usually sends a window of packet, and this is true for both client and server, and then waits a round trip time for acknowledgement. It's a round trip time because the a client packet has to arrive to the server and then the server sends the acknowledgement so it takes round trip time uh, for the acknowledge to arrive to the client. And uh, RTT time, round trip time, is very noticeable. So using that um, boundary effect, the attacker can easily distinguish uh, between the cases where the size uh, of the payload is less or equal than the, this window or to the case where the size of this payload is bigger than that window. And if the payload length is exactly on the data boundary, the attacker can determine one by differences because it's even if the payload overflows just by one byte, then all of a sudden the, there is a big fine over this uh, uh, overflow because it will take one more round trip time uh, for there is uh, for it to be sent. <coughs> so the attacker has the ability to uh, to distinguish between one byte differences. And remember that our attacker has uh, the ability to add as many uh, characters as he would like. So the attacker is fully able to put. Uh, to create the case where the client is sent or the server depends on what is attacking that will be exactly on that boundary. So any change of one extra byte will be very noticeable. And let's see it in the wild and first request timing. So we sent a request with the Chrome browser and the Chrome browser send two packets and then wait. And if it needs to send uh, three packets, even if it's one more byte, then you pay uh, one extra round trip time. <coughs> one extra round trip time. Uh, in the red box, we can see that the uh, round trip time is uh, 170 milliseconds. So it's uh, quite a, a long time uh, with respect to the whole request, very noticeable. And the same effect also exists for the responses. Uh, the Apache server implements a window of three packets and if it needs to send the fourth, it, it pays one extra round trip time and we can see this uh, payment of round trip time happening every fourth request, every, every fourth uh, packet of the request. So we had seen that using timing measurements, we can recover uh, size differences. Now we only need to show that uh, it can be done with the JavaScript. So how would do we do it with the JavaScript? Well, uh, we can do it for a HTTP request timing by creating HTTP requests with the XHR uh, directive, the XML HTTP request directive. And uh, in fact, in this case, the same origin policy will kill the response, but that, that's very good for us because we are, <coughs> we are only interested in the request. And we c that way, we can uh, measure just the request time. And we use the uh, get time on, <coughs> on that uh, XHR event and uh, in order to measure time. And this is an important part. We eliminate the noise because <coughs> originally we thought that the different delays and jitter over the network will sabotage with our uh, timing measurements. But if we do it a couple of times and take the minimal value, or we could have uh, averaged down this uh, <coughs> this random delay and get the uh, original results. And we can see here our results of measuring time, <coughs> measuring request time with JavaScript. And 
On the left hand side, we can see the results from uh, the internal debugger of Chrome. And on the right hand side, we can see the <coughs> result as created, uh, as created with our JavaScript. And uh, we can see that uh, timing can be correctly recovered. Thank you, Alex, for that. And so, just a sec. <coughs> so timing can be correctly captured. As we can see, the result from the JavaScript are very similar to the result that coming out from the uh, Chrome debugger. And the results are conclusive. I didn't include in this screenshot all of the results, but we can see that for the shorter, in, in this case, we had sent uh, alternately uh, messages with one by difference, and uh, that was just across that uh, window, that boundary, and we can see that the results are very, very conclusive as uh, the difference between the bigger and the smaller one is uh, almost twice as much, it takes almost twice as much time, so the differences are very noticeable. <clears throat> and we've done the same, this was a, a proof concept with JavaScript uh, for the request, we've done the same with the JavaScript for the response, in this case we used uh, iframe and change the source of the iframe with the JavaScript. Uh, it works fine, but there is some problem if the site uses the XFrame option headers. It can uh, block us from uh, block us from uh, containing uh, iframe from uh, the site in our attacker site. <clears throat> in our attacker site. So we can, uh, we came up with uh, image source and for image source, uh, image source is not tamed uh, by the X-frame option header and the result flows in. And again, we use uh, the get time on the image event and recover the original timing. So let's conclude that phase and revisit our claim. So <clears throat> we had shown the HTTP payload size may carry sensitive information and most, more specifically, uh, timing differences cre uh, carry that sen sensitive information. Uh, I'm sorry, size differences carries the, the same, uh, the, that sensitive information. <clears throat> Using the timing me measurement, the attacker can distinguish the HTTP payload size differences and this timing measurement can be taken from a JavaScript from the attacker side. So the result is the attacker can learn the user sensitive information using JavaScript from their side with no eavesdropping, which makes the crime attack very practical since you know the attacker no longer needs <coughs> the attacker no longer needs to be an eavesdropper. So we might ask ourselves, where was the same origin policy in this case? Because same origin policy was meant to prevent malicious scripts served from one site to leak data to other site. This is exactly the purpose of the same origin policy. And here, using a script, we were able to deduce secret, uh, uh, the secret information uh, on uh, on other secret site from our site, so there is some problem with the same origin policy. And <coughs> so I think there is a greater lesson in, uh, in here for us, a general lesson that automation introduces new risks because <coughs> simple multimedia tags are exempt from same origin policy. You can uh, include within your HTML uh, page and uh, images from other domains and other sites. It's acceptable. And so it seems that enabling uh, image source manipulation by JavaScript, it wouldn't change too much. So because the 
the programmer could have uh, manually uh, create references f and fetch images from other side. So I'm, when I enable JavaScript to do so, I'm not changing anything. Nothing has changed. However, something had changed because now it can be done automatically. And the URL can be set interactively and you can measure the load time. So although enabling JavaScript to, uh, to edit and manipulate the source did not add any functional, any new functional feature, the ability to do so automatically introduces new risk. And we have to consider it each time we are doing something that was previously manually and we turn it to, to be automatic, we introduce new risks, risks that we are not necessarily aware of. Just in this case, you know, who would have thought that uh, uh, allowing to manipulate uh, uh, an image uh, URL will leak some secret data which is not in images by using uh, by abusing all kind of uh, features of compression and JavaScript timing and so forth. So uh, let's uh, uh, wrap it up and w with some mitigation. What we have shown is <coughs> we had resurrected the crime attack with extended crime attack against uh, responses. We introduced the time attack to launch size diff uh, attacks with no if dropping requirement. The original crime, the extended crime, <coughs> there's one that I haven't discussed, but since we have time, uh, let's discuss it. This login detection using timing information. Let's start with size information. Uh, you, you can detect whether a user is logged in to some uh, to some other service by sending again with the JavaScript some request to that uh, service and in many, ta ma in many cases if the user is logged into this service then he would actually do something and uh, it takes more time and when it's not connected and not authenticated to that service it will get some kind of you are not authenticated a message right away so again you, you can use the, another example of size and uh, timing info information leak. And again, apl application specific, such as the example of number of digits of digits in your uh, bank balance. And before we we go to discuss the mitigation, let's say what wouldn't work. So, as the Lucky Thirteen authors write, and Lucky Thirteen is another uh, recently published attack against SSL using timing, it says a natural reaction to timing-based attacks is to add random time delay to frustrate statistical analysis. In fact, this countermeasure is surprisingly ineffective. And the reason is really obvious, uh, that since this uh, extra delay, ex extra random time delay is random, we can use uh, statistical analysis and create number of, re number of uh, requests and uh, average down this random delay or take the minimal value as we had done in order to uh, eliminate this uh, random time delay. So this wouldn't work. So what would work? So we recommend that browsers should support and respect the X-Frame options ahead of for all content inclusion, not just iframe. And when you think of it, it's very logical. It will allow application to take control over the presentation of their content on other domain. The same way you don't want your uh, original content to be framed in another site, this is the same way you don't want your images to be displayed uh, by some other side. Or maybe you do and you want to explicitly allow it or, uh, or the other way around, you want to explicitly uh, uh, prohibit sites from including your images. Right now, there is no uh, HTTP directive that allows you to do so. And by including such, by applying the X-Frame option for images, or other equivalent header, X image options, if you like, uh, for images, then uh, the 
original application can control the presentation of its original uh, content on other sites. And what application can do? First, application should take control over their content. They should implement CSF protection, so they will uh, govern the way that their content is being accessed. So they will know it's the user had wanted to get there and not just send there with the, another application. And use the X-Frame option header as we had discussed. Another good advice is beware of unknown parameters. If you remember the Twitter example that we had shown that uh, by just pushing some unknown parameter uh, uh, that was not part of the application, we were able to control some parts of the response uh, uh, content. And this could be, have been mitigated if uh, the application had some way to uh, block or be uh, alerted on the existence of unknown parameters. They're not just embedded into the response. And finally, deploy anti-automation measures, such as the case when we tr uh, tried our proof of concept against uh, Google. Sometimes uh, Google w uh, got angry of us and uh, said, oh, you're trying too, too many times. Please open, please uh, solve a captcha for me to prove that you are human. So it was, the thresholds were not as t so tight because we were able to uh, to really deploy this attack against Google Scholar, but uh, if it would had if it had been uh, correctly tuned, then it would have been a proper mitigation uh, against uh, this kind of attacks. With that, I conclude. If there are any questions. Yeah. Don't have that, right? yeah, so CISF uh, token seems like a, a logical uh, target for, for this attack, and also uh, this allows us to get rid of the, that application specific because it's uh, related to many frameworks and we can have something more general than application specific. So, very good uh, remark. Uh, th this is, was not over uh, SSL. It, it just was t to prove that the uh, uh, timing uh, over uh, uh, the network can be can be captured. And uh, having said that, uh, of course, it would have been better, you know, to do the whole thing. But uh, as we had seen, the timing attack is not necessarily related. Uh, to SSL. In, in this case, if we drop the eavesdropper uh, requirement, then uh, it makes sense that this way the attacker can guess something it, it cannot see because it's on third site and it can, uh, cannot see it also on the network because it's not an eavesdropper. So even uh, if it doesn't work for SSL, and I guess it would work for SSL because time, uh, size is uh, remained over the SSL. Of course, there w might be some practical issues and overhead and so forth, and w you might need a lot of more requests in order to uh, uh, get some noises out of the, uh, the system. Uh, but even if it doesn't work on the SSL, there is a lot of cases where uh, timing uh, is contains valuable information on non-SSL cases. Okay, thank you very much.